Okay, uh, now before I start, I would like to ask you uh, how do you want us to do this? Because this is a quite uh, um, complex topic. This is heavy stuff, really. Uh, this, in my view, is uh, maybe the most problematic issue that we are facing currently in, in normative ethics. So, I don't know if uh, you are more or less familiar with normative ethics or have some interest in it, or just have no interest in it or haven't heard a lot about it, but just because you saw the title, how paradoxical is ethics, you thought, well, maybe this could be interesting. So, because, uh, I, can, I mean, we can do this in a deeper way, going in detail into the uh, topics, or we can try to make a, an easier presentation of it. Uh, and also, what we can do is this. If you want, I can do the whole presentation, and then after it, we can have some debate, some discussion. Uh, I think this may be better to understand the whole, the whole view. But on the other hand, if you are not familiar with the, the issues that we are going to handle here, uh, it may be better if I just start making the presentation and when we reach some point, at, at which uh, you know everything is getting too complex, uh, we can stop there and try to examine it together. And then, even if we don't uh, see all the issues, uh, we can get a, a more broad understanding of, of at least some of the topics. So, what do you prefer? Should we go to the complex and the total stuff, or should we go step by step and see where we reach? Your desire is my command, so... Uh, <laughs> both? <laughs> uh, well, uh, both, okay. Well, I don't know, if you want to... Okay, how many of you want, uh, want me to, to give the whole presentation, uh, even if there are things that aren't properly understood and then we tackle them? How long does it take? I don't know. How, how much time you have we have? One hour approximately. Yeah, I can try to make it shorter than that, yeah. Okay. Half. Yeah. Okay, well, I didn't count, I don't know if someone... <laughs> okay, and how many of you prefer that, I, that we go step by step, block by block? <laughs> well... Yes, everybody's thinking we have it on the video anyway, so... Okay. <laughs> Yeah, you can, you can add the video later and see what, what the video says. Okay, uh, so, uh, uh, so well, let's do it this way. Okay, so um, the title is about, uh, well, as, as uh, Adriano said, about some paradoxes that, are, that arise um, because there are uh, several intuitions that not all people, but many people, maybe most people have, right? Uh, and uh, uh, it's not something that we tend to think in this way and tend to think in this other way. There are things that we strongly believe to be in that way and uh, uh, that uh, can't be held together consistently. And most people aren't aware of this because they haven't thought about this. So we're going to see um, what happens with this. And I'm going to start with two intuitive axioms. The first one is the transitivity of betterness. What this just means is that if, uh, well, that symbol there, uh, which uh, is used usually in mathematics to mean bigger than, we're going to use it here to, to mean better than or preferable than. So we uh, normally assume that it, if a certain option or a certain situation, a certain outcome is better than another one, and if this other outcome is better than this outcome, then the first outcome is better than the third one, right? Most people think this. I mean, it actually seems crazy not to think this. And then the asymmetry of betterness. This is, I mean, even more, uh, uh, strikes us as even more clear. If x is better than y, then y can't be better than x, right? This seems clear. Okay. Now, uh, once we have seen this, 
uh, we can consider um, our intuitions we have regarding how to compare outcomes. And there is one way which is, again, very intuitive, which is the internal aspects view, which is how good an outcome is. An outcome is a situation, is a, or a state of, a state of affair that can concern us or can concern other, other individuals as well. So to see how good it is, we have to look at its internal aspects, not at the internal aspect of another possible uh, uh, state of affairs. And when we compare them, what we are comparing, if we are comparing this situation with this situation, what we compare is the aspects, the characteristics, the features of this one and this other one, right? So, if we assume this, it seems that transitivity and asymmetry follows, right? So, this seems clear. But then there is this other view that we may call the essentially comparative view. And this view would say that how good an outcome is it, it may depend on how good other alternatives are, right? So, uh, suppose that I'm considering whether to have a chocolate or strawberry ice cream. And they say, well, uh, and you have these two options. And I would say, well, yeah, I'll go for strawberry. And then they say, wait, but look, we also have mango, mango ice cream, right? And I prefer strawberry ice cream over mango ice cream, and I also prefer chocolate ice cream over mango ice cream. It seems that my, my choice shouldn't vary, right? But some people claim that it may vary, okay? I prefer these two alternatives over, over this one. When I compare these two alternatives, I prefer this one, but then when I introduce this other one, I choose this other one. Right? This is the essentially comparative view. And according to this one, transitivity and even uh, asymmetry may not follow. Right? So, uh, how many of you think that the uh, essentially comparative view uh, makes sense? And how many of you think that the internal aspects view makes sense? Okay. Right. And then, Apart from this, there is this. Yep. You think it's viewed the assumption of uh, independence of irrelevant alternatives, right? Uh, well, the, that that's what into the internal aspects view. Yeah. I mean, it's more complex, but uh, I prefer that we don't get into the all the details because otherwise we don't finish finish the the talk. Okay, so then there's, there's this other intuitive uh, idea. I mean, these uh, may seem unconnected at first, but uh, I want to present them first, so then later we, we see the problems that arise when we combine them. And this is this one, an intuitive idea, which is the personal affective restriction. We say that um, if we compare two outcomes, right? Outcome X and outcome Y, and we go to outcome X and we go one by one checking how all the individuals in it are with comparison to uh, how they would be in outcome Y, right? Or how would they not be if they didn't exist in outcome Y? And we see that all of them prefer to be in outcome X. Or if, we, if, if you prefer, rather than, than speaking about what they prefer, it seems that all of them are better off in outcome X, right? Rather than Y. Intuitively, this gives us compelling reasons to believe that X is better than Y. Hmm? But uh, still, uh, as we will see, uh, well, uh, before we get into that, how many of you think that this idea is a sound idea, is a, a reasonable idea? How many of you think that this is a questionable idea? Okay, few people. Okay. Well, so we'll see now. Okay, thus far, uh, uh, your intuitions seem to match what uh, the intuitions of most people are. Right. So the problem is that all these intuitions don't fit together. So, um, in order to see this, we can start by checking out what are the different view ways that we have to question the internal aspect view, and by questioning this, Questioning also transitivity. And uh, there are two different ways in which we can question this. The first one is by appealing 
to person affecting principles, that is, by taking into account this intuitive idea that, that I have just mentioned, or but by not appealing at, at, at person affecting principles, that is, by considering just the, the problem of transitivity in itself. So um, these are two different ways of uh, appraising the, the issue, and I'm going to tackle first the second one, right? So uh, in order to see this, I'm going to present a couple of examples. And the first one is that of spectrum cases. There are many different examples of spectrum cases. I'm going to just present one, but the many other similar ones can be compared. So suppose that uh, some, uh, I don't know, some mad uh, uh, sadistic person uh, kidnaps you. And uh, this person gives you two choices. This person can torture you, do terrible things to you, I mean, very painful uh, uh, things to you for one year, or he can do slightly less, slightly less painful things uh, for four years. And what he will do is he will torture you for one year, then stop one week, then torture you for another year, then stop one week, and so on, four times, right? But the pain you will suffer will be slightly less, right? Uh, this is an example that uh, Larry Tenkin, I'm, I'm, I'm doing some variations uh, in it because I think they make it work better, but it, this is basically an example presented by Larry Tenkin, which is the, the theorist that, I, that has been working on this. And actually, I have to say that this initial presentation of the issue that I'm making, uh, I mean, it's not me who has, uh, uh, you know, come up with this at all. It's all Larry's work and the work of others such as uh, Stuart Rachel's. Um, the only original part of it is that it's the last part in which I try to come up with some solution that maybe don't work, but anyway. So, uh, how many of you prefer the one year of torture? And how many of you prefer the four year of torture? Okay, but it's just a slightly less uh, torture, but it's still you prefer four years. Okay, well, most people prefer one year of torture. Or we could say, well, instead of one and four, we can compare one about a century of torture. Well, so we prefer intuitively A over B, right? But then suppose that um, we face a, a different choice. We can compare the four years of slightly less torture. I mean, for instance, suppose that the one year of torture is that they burn your whole body and then they put some cream on you that, uh, you know, heals again while they are burning so you don't die. And the four years is the same thing except this part of your body, one centimeter, uh, one square centimeter here that is not burned, right? That's the, the difference between one year and four years. So now we, we have uh, the four years torture against, say, 16 years of torture, the same torture, but it's not that they keep this place without the burn, but also this other place, so it's like this. For 16 years. How many of you prefer four years? Okay, uh, how many of you prefer 16 years? None. Okay. So we prefer B over C. And then the next question would be, instead of 16, say, I don't know, uh, 64 or 70, whatever. And you would prefer 60. And so on, we could go. And in each case, there is, a, the, in the next step, we have a much longer time and just a slightly less pain. The problem with this is that we go on, go on, and eventually we get to this situation in which we have situation C. And in situation C, uh, what we, the problem we have is that every month, we are beaten by a mosquito. Huh? So, but we live for a, such a long time, such a long time, that uh, that's the situation at which we reach. So, this situation is, appears to us to be clearly worse than this one. This one appears to be clearly worse than this one. This one appears to be clearly worse than this one. And so we go on and on. And at the end, we reach to this situation. One mosquito bite each month. And this should be way worse, much worse than one year of torture. But intuitively, 
if you hadn't uh, seen this argument, if at first I, I asked you, what would you prefer? One year of terrible torture or for a, an enormous, uh, an, an enormous uh, uh, time, one mosquito bite a month, how many of you would prefer the one year of torture? Very few of you. Well, I would prefer one year of torture, but that's because I, I know the argument. But before the argument, I wouldn't. So, uh, this is a problem. And then a similar problem is that of the Meradician paradox. Uh, are you familiar with the Meradician paradox or should I explain it? How many of you are not familiar with it? Oh, okay, so I'll, I'll present it. So, uh, well, this is a classic in contemporary moral philosophy. Um, and it's a problem presented um, 30 years ago by Derek Parfit, arguably the most important moral philosophy um, uh, who's alive. And um, in A, we have a population of people. So uh, that's where that box represents the, the population. So uh, the length like this represents how many individuals are. And the height represents the level of well-being they have. So we may have, say, a billion people experiencing a great life, a wonderful life, terrific life, fantastic, right? And in A plus, we have those individuals, and then we also have uh, a, an extra billion of individuals who are also doing fantastic. They are doing great, but, you know, maybe not so great as, as the others, but it's still pretty good. Pretty good. I mean, fantastic. Much better than any of us would ever. I mean, uh, more than anyone who has ever lived. Okay. How many of you think that A plus is worse than A? I'm not asking you how many of you think that A plus is better. How many of you think it's, it's worse? Worse, sorry. How many of you think A plus is worse than A? And how many of you think that A plus is not worse than A. Okay, more people think it's not worse. Okay, but then we consider B. In B, the only thing that happens is that we have eliminated the inequality, right? So, um, and if you want, we can also increase a bit the well-being, the total well-being. So utilitarians would have to present to prefer B, and egalitarians would have to, pre to prefer B. So say that in A+, plus, the level of well-being is, I don't know, 150, and 150 here, and 130 here, and then in B, they are all at 142, right? So how many of you think that B is worse than A+, plus? Okay, so most of you don't think so. The problem with this is that then we could introduce B plus and we would reach C and then we would introduce C plus and eventually we would reach Z and in Z we have a bunch of individuals, a hell of a lot of them uh, and their, their well-being is just enough for their lives being worth living. And according to this, C can't be worse than A. But most of us think that A is preferable to C, right? So, how many of you would, uh, maybe you, you change your mind now, but how many of you would initially say that A is not worse than C? Okay, and how many people how many people here would prefer C to A? Okay. So uh, we have a problem with your intuitions here, right? Okay. So, well, this is a problem. And this is a problem that uh, those defending the essentially comparative view, such as Temkin, have uh, used to criticize the internal aspect view. So, what happens here is that we have two principles, or several principles, that appear to clearly be more important than other principles in certain circumstances, for certain comparisons. But in other comparisons, 
they seem to be outweighed by other principles. So when we compare, for instance, intensity of pain against duration of pain, hmm, at first, in the torture spectrum, we give more importance to the duration of pain. But then when we compare A to C, we give far more importance to the intensity of pain over the duration of pain, right? Okay, so how can we then uh, criticize this view? Well, the first one is by uh, appealing to person-affecting principles. So um, one of the person-affecting principles is uh, the one that is called the narrow person-affecting uh, principle. And this is a principle that is based on the idea that we mentioned before, that an outcome can't be better than another one um, if, um, oh sorry, that we can't say that an, out an outcome is better than another if uh, it's not better for uh, the individuals involved. So this principle uh, has been used to uh, assess, um, for instance, what goes on in A and A+. Plus. So Derek Parsley has uh, pointed out that when we compare A and A+, plus, we can uh, reach different results uh, depending on how we examine the problem uh, and how, what are the individuals involved. So suppose that half of the population in A are P and the other half are Q. Suppose that then in A+, plus, P and Q remain in the same situation, but we just add R and S. According to Parfit, this is so, um, this, this change uh, doesn't uh, make anything worse. Because for the individuals involved uh, in A, the situation is just the same, and there are some extra individuals who are fine. But, uh, he has argued, the situation would be different if, uh, in the comparison, what happened was that the individuals at P uh, would remain in the same situation, but those at Q would see their well-being reduced. And the new individuals that we introduced, well, some of them would be at a very good level of well-being, but others would be at the same, at the same level that uh, those in Q are. Uh, can you understand this? This is quite easy to understand, right? So, part to say, in the first case, the situation is not worse. In the second case, the situation is worse. Why? Because he is considering a person affecting principle. And according to a person affecting principle, when we compare A and A+, plus, we consider those affected, hmm, in those who are in both situations. Hmm? This is the narrow person affecting principle. So, what happens with this principle is, we can define it, uh, we can define it as this. In assessing possible outcomes, one should focus on the status of independently existing people, that is, those who exist in the two outcomes, and the interests of those who are dependent on which outcome exists, those who only exist in one outcome, uh, don't count as much, right? Why? Because this is the only way in which we can uh, rescue that idea that uh, for an outcome uh, to be better, uh, it has to be better for, uh, uh, those, for, for all the individuals involved so, uh, in, in, in the comparison. And all the individuals that are involved in the comparison are uh, those that exist in both plus the ones that exists in each of them, but uh, um, since they don't exist in both of them, uh, will be better off out of existing if their well-being is over zero, right? So they don't lose anything uh, for their well-being being, being uh, uh, less than the well-being of others in other situations, whereas the ones that are in both situations do lose something if their well-being is more reduced in uh, uh, one of the scenarios. Okay, uh, so uh, this uh, uh, principle allows us to make a comparison here between A and B. So if we have to compare A and B, uh, how many of you think that A and B are equivalent, are just the same? 
And how many of you prefer, say, P, say, A? And how many of you prefer B? Okay, well, right. So, if you accept the principle that we have presented, you have to choose B over A. Why? Because if we compare B against A, in B, there are the people who are in Q, or the individuals, they can be sentient animals or whatever. Well, then we can call animals people because they are sentient beings like us. Anyway, so those who are in Q are better off in B over A, right? So if we just consider those in, in, in Q, the situation in B is better. And we can consider, well, but what about those who are in R or those who are in P? Well, for them, you know, if you are in R, you are going to be better off if B is chosen, right? Because in A, you won't exist and your well-being is positive. So it's better for you that B is chosen. And if you're in P, the same situation happens. It's better for you to choose A, right? Because in B, you don't exist. So it's better for everyone. Whatever we choose, it's going to be better for everyone. So, given that this is so, let us choose B, because in B there are some that will be better off, which are, which are those who are in Q. You understand the, the, the logic of, of the reason? Okay, now the problem with this is that if we accept this, we reach tran intransitive uh, 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 sets of choices. Because if we accept this principle, if we have to compare A and B, we will prefer B, because those in Q are better off. When we compare B and C, we have to choose C, because those in R are better off. If we consider C and A, we have to consider A, because those in P are better off. So according to the narrow uh, personal affective principle that their Parfit uh, uh, has presented, and Larry Tenkin has examined it as well, A is better than B, B is better than C, and C is better than A. Okay, but this is not the only person affecting principle that we have. There are other person affecting principles. And this one is one that is very intuitive. They, I've called it the actuality dependent person affecting principles. So, what this principle says that when we are comparing two scenarios, the ones that have priority are the ones that are existing in the actual world, right? So the definition is exactly like that of the narrow <coughs> person affecting principle. The only situation is that in that principle that perfect presents, what is relevant is uh, those individuals that have priority are those that exist in all the options that we compare. And in this one, what we consider is primarily the interest of those who exist in the actual world, right? So for instance, Suppose that, uh, I don't know, um, suppose that a mother can have a child, right? And we know that the child is going to live a bad life. Uh, most people think that the mother shouldn't have that child, even if the life of the mother uh, were going to be better out of that. You understand the case? How many of you don't think that the mother shouldn't have the child. Okay, no one thinks this. But um, an argument here that has been presented, uh, which is the symmetry argument, is this one. If we say this, then it seems that we have to say that if a mother could, could have a child, and we are setting uh, aside for, for uh, for the sake of the argument, the impact that this child may have uh, on others and everything. So suppose that a mother can have a child and the child will have a great life. Hmm? But if the mother has the child, the life of the mother will be worse, right? So this can be the, the case of any of you. You could have a child and your life would be definitely worse, but it's still worth living. But the life of the child would be good. Of course, we can never be sure about this, but suppose our guess is this. Or we can just not have the child, right? 
How many of you think that we have reasons, compelling reasons, such as the ones we have for not having a child we know will suffer, uh, in favor to having the child? Okay, very few people. And, well, you, you can have this view for a bunch of reasons, but most people have this view because they believe in this principle. Because you are giving more importance to the interests of those who are existing now than to possible future, future uh, individuals. Okay. And there could be also what we could say the time-dependent personal affecting principle, which would be just the same, except that instead of, instead of speaking about actual people, uh, actual individuals, we would be speaking about the individuals who exist first, prior individuals, okay? Because we don't have much time, I'm going to rush, uh, and I'm not going to uh, explain the difference between this and the other. And there's also another principle that is about those whose identity is already determined. We don't need to go into the details of this, I'm just presenting this for for making it for, for the sake of, of you know introducing you to the to this problem, but anyway, we can move move further. So, what happens is that suppose that we accept this principle that we we've examined now, that focuses on the individuals that exist now, and we have to compare A and B. What situation is better, A or B? It depends of what is the actual situation, right? So, suppose that the actual situation is A. Hmm? We live in a world in which there are two individuals, hmm? P and Q. And they ask us, suppose that instead of uh, things having gone as they have in our world, things were different, and as a result of this, uh, instead of P, R would exist, and the well-being of Q would be higher, but the well-being of R would be lower than that of P, right? To flesh it out, suppose that P is, uh, again, uh, the mother of, uh, um, no, sorry, that Q is the mother of a child, P, who has that level of well-being, right? So this is what has happened. Uh, and we compare it against another world, in which uh, the level of well-being of the mother is higher, but she has another baby. Hmm? She didn't have the child that she has actually had, but another one. And the well-being of their baby is uh, uh, lower. Okay. If we accept this principle, we will have to say that we don't know which world is better until we know which world is the actual one. So if the actual world is A, then A is better than B. And if the actual world is B, then B is better than A. And I remember one example that uh, uh, Nick Baxter uh, presented about this once. He said, okay, suppose we compare two worlds. And in one world, one world is the actual world. And the, another world is the actual world with two differences. And the first one is that uh, I have a, I don't know if it was like this, but it was similar to this. Uh, and in, in the second one, one day I have a headache, eh? which I don't have in the actual world, and it's bad for me to have a headache. And that's the first difference. And the second difference is that there is this glorious civilization in, in Mars, right, in which a bunch of sentient beings live wonderful lives, right? So which, which scenario is better? Well, it depends on which is the actual scenario, right? So if the actual scenario is Mars, is, is the second one. So suppose that we live in the, in the, that there were this bunch of sentient beings living great, and we decide, okay, would, wouldn't you prefer a world in which all these beings wouldn't exist, but hey, you wouldn't have this headache, right? We would say, well, maybe it's not worth it. But given that the actual world is different, we may say, well, you know, those individuals in Mars don't exist, so who cares about them? And it's better for me not to have this headache. Right? So, the problem with the, well, the problem, uh, this, the characteristic that we can mention with this, the first one, is that we can say that A is better than B or B is better than A, which we could in the case of the narrow personal affection principle. 
It all depends on facts, on which is the actual world, right? Interestingly, what happens here is that if we set aside facts, it's not only that here we can reach intransitive uh, 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 comparisons. It's that here, asymmetry don't apply, because A may be better than B, and B may be better than A, right? And then, the thing is that if we consider C, given a certain actual world, both transitivity and asymmetry apply. So transitivity is safe if we assume this principle instead of the narrow person affecting principle. Okay? Well, so far, this is, I guess, complex enough. I'm sorry, but um, I warned you. But still, you wanted to. You wanted to hear it all. Too late. Again. Okay. So, we have then that person affective principles can be distinguished according to two features. First, whether they appear to give rise to non asymmetric comparison of betterness, so x better than y, y better than x, and to whether they avoid intransitivity and non asymmetry if we assume a certain world as actual. Uh, I think that for those who are interested in normative ethics and in population ethics, this may be very interesting. For those who are not, this may be heady and boring as hell. But, uh, I'm sorry, what can I do about it? Okay. So, then we have this, that if whether an outcome is better than another one, depends on which of the outcomes is the actual or the previous one. So then these facts need to be taken into account of the comparison. So this is interesting because this is what can help us to argue against the view that claims that intransitivity may apply, right? So now, uh, thus far I've uh, presented the Larry's, Larry Temkin's view and Stuart Rachel's view and Parfit's view with some comments uh, by myself, and the last part uh, with actuality or so uh, are things that I've added there. But now I'm going to tackle the, the possible solutions that we may have to counter this view. So, um, the thing is that we can consider these futures as something that is internal to outcomes or as something that is external to outcomes. Let me explain what it is. We saw that when we compare A and B and C outcome situations, we get this puzzle, because it seems that A is better than B, B is better than C, but then C is better than A. What are we going to do with this? So, uh, in order to uh, assess this, one possibility is to say, okay, what happens is that what makes A being better than B, but being worse than C, is something internal. Something that is proper to the outcome, but it may be that it's something external to it, right? So, if it's internal to outcomes, what we can say is simply that they are not the same outcome, right? That when we compare A against B or A against C, even if the same individuals are there, the outcome is different. Why? Well, because the fact of being actual or not changes the outcome, right? So then, um, we can accept that transitivity still applies because we are not considering the same outcome, right? And then we have another possibility, which is that uh, these facts, uh, oh, Anes is missing there, the fact that they are uh, actual or not, or that they are prior or not, and all this stuff, uh, is not internal to outcome, but it's something external to them. But then what happens is that when we are comparing a against B and B against C, it's not only A that we are comparing, or B that we are comparing. It's A plus the fact that A is actual against B, or A against B and the fact that B is, out, is actual, right? So if they give us a description of what individuals are, what is their well-being and all that, they haven't told us the whole story. 
there are still more information that we need to make the comparison, right? Of course, this can be problematic when we compare uh, two outcomes and neither of them is actual. Suppose that we have to compare A and B. Uh, this is A and this is B. So here we have P and Q and here we have P and Q and it's just that they change the situation in which they are. In which they are. We can simply say, well, it's irrelevant. They are both equal, right? Because that element, the fact that one of them is actual or prior or whatever, hasn't been introduced. Okay? So, if this is so, again, uh, transitivity applies. Why? Because it's not A better than B better than C better than A, but rather A plus P certain position is better than P plus P is better than C plus P, and C plus P is better than E plus not P, but something different from P. Got it? Yeah? No. Okay. None of my business. It's your problem. Well, no. I'm just joking. It's going to be my problem because then you're going to ask me. I don't, I don't know what I'm going to say. I try to come up with something. Okay. So, what I have done before is I have been trying to give a solution of why when we consider person affecting principles, hmm, we can still maintain a, an internal aspect view and a, a transitivity. But this is only possible if the person affecting principle that we accept is the one that is based on the idea of being actual or being prior. If we accept the narrow person affecting principle, there is no way in which we can go on accepting transitivity. We have to give it up, right? So, you remember the solution that Derek Parfit gave to the, the uh, Meradition paradox? Remember that? We were comparing A against A plus, hmm? uh, and he was saying, well, you know, uh, A may be, sorry, A plus may be worse than A if what happens is that those who were in A now are worse off if we accept that idea, hmm, then transitivity no longer applies. Right. But then we have these other alternatives, which are uh, other alternative ways of criticizing intransitivity, which are the first ones that I mentioned. That's, that is those that don't appeal to person affecting principles. And this is what happens in, in the case of spectrum cases. Because, because in spectrum cases, we are not considering different populations, and we are not considering uh, different possible worlds with different individuals, some individuals living in one and not in the other. No, no, no. We're in the middle, we're, we're considering just one individual, one individual that is you or whoever. And it's very clear, it's just one possible world, it may be the actual world, so we don't face any of these problems. In fact, we can also present uh, other spectrum cases. For instance, instead of saying, one year of torture against four years of torture against 16 years of torture, we can consider the following. Suppose that we are working at the World Health Organization and we have to decide whether to, kill, whether to heal uh, one person who suffers from, uh, say, uh, uh, AIDS, right? Or better than that, we can kill, we can kill. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, my, <laughs> my dark thoughts <laughs> come up. Uh, suppose that we have this medicine that can, or we could develop this medicine that would cure one people from Ebola. This is one person that is gonna die now and we can save her life. Or we can save four people from AIDS. And this is peop these are people who will live for, say, 10 more years and they will die. Hmm? So, uh, who would say uh, the four people? Okay. Who would say one people, one person? Okay, less people. Okay. And now uh, you say, okay, we can say four people from AIDS, which will, would die in 10 years. Or 16 people from cancer that will die in, well, say, it's a long-term cancer or whatever, 
they will die in 20 years, right? And again, uh, most people may, if, if it's 60, or maybe we can say, I don't know, 20, 30, would save those 30. So we can go on and on, and at the end of the day, we, we reach the situation in which we can either save the life of a person who will die for Ebola, or cure mild headache of billions of people, right? And it seems that curing the, the, the headaches is far, far more important, right? Or suppose that you can, there is this person that will be mutilated and will lose both arms and both legs, legs right? Or this other, uh, say, I don't know, 50 people that will lose, say, uh, both arms and one leg. So would you save the 50 or the one? Who would save the 50? Okay. And now we compare, okay, but then we have these other 200, say, that will lose one arm and one leg. So if the number of individuals is longer. And then there is this, I don't know, thousand that will lose one leg or say one arm. And then there are these more that will lose just this, just one hand. And then some fingers. And at the end of the day, we prefer to save millions of people from losing maybe a half of a nail rather than from, say, which is, you know, saving one from say, losing both arms and two legs, which is clearly counterintuitive. So, this case clearly gives us, um, at first, reason to doubt that transitivity applies. And transitivity is very, very compelling, right? But it seems that, definitely seems that C is better than A, and A is better than B, B better than C, etc. So how can we, how can we reply? Uh, how can we respond to this argument? So I want to say that rejecting the action of transitivity doesn't save the problem. And the reason is this, that we can ask, what is the best outcome in the spectrum, right? So how many of you think that it is better to save the person of one life, of one, sorry, the person of one life. Uh, uh. How many of you think that it's better to save the life of one person rather than curing a billion people from some mild headache? How many of you think this? Some people. It's good that others have probably changed your mind after looking at the arguments. Because this, this shows that you are rational people that can dismiss your biases, that can reflect on your attitudes. Awesome. Uh, I don't know, this is maybe... This is maybe arrogant because this is what happened to me. But uh, Larry, Larry Temkin uh, thinks I'm, I'm nuts for, for believing this. He said, well, how can you prefer uh, one mosquito bite over one year of torture? And I would say, yeah, go year of torture. And he said, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, but then when I asked him, what is the best outcome in the spectrum? He would say, I don't know. How come you don't know? Okay, so suppose the sadistic uh, torturer holds you and say, okay, you have this broad range of torture. Choose one. I'm sure I would choose the one year of torture. But suppose that you are not so sure about that. What are the options that you could choose? The thing is that uh, um, you have to choose not the one that is better to the following one, but the one that is the best one. The one that is better than all the rest of them, right? So if you reject the action of transitivity, you have not uh, solved anything here. So what are the possible solutions here? Well, uh, this is A, and A is the one that you would choose if you accept, accept uh, expected utility. It's also the one that you would choose if you gave more, if you gave, uh, more weight to the duration of, of pain over their, their intensity. And then you could choose C, if you gave more importance to the intensity of pains over the duration, that is lexical priority. Yeah. So no matter how, how, how long it, it, it takes a pain, 
if the pain is slightly uh, harder, uh, you choose the first pain. This is unbelievable for me, but it's a possible solution that could be helpful. And also, uh, it's possible some people claim that we should choose the strongest immediate preference. So because the immediate preference of C over A is, seems to be bigger than the immediate irreflective preference of B over C, we would go for C. And then another solution would be to include a critical level and say, well, yeah, at some point it doesn't matter. You, because, you know, mosquito bites, we don't even feel them so... I mean, we feel them, but we don't feel them very significantly. So we could use this cut model and cut, and we could choose M, which would be in between, right? The problem with M is that uh, um, M would be both better than L and N. That is, that solution M would be better than the previous one to it, and the form, and the, and the, and the next one to it. And the criteria to compare L to M and M to N would be the same. That is, exactly, absolutely exactly the same reasons to prefer M over L apply in favor of N over M. Got it? No? Well, you tell me now. Um, so this seems to be a high price to pay because this seems to be inconsistent, right? And um, moreover, this price seems to be even less high than the price that has rejective transitivity. Because rejecting transitivity really is messy. If we reject transitivity, then I could say, okay, uh, I'm going to go out this, uh, this uh, uh, afternoon because it's better for me to go out rather than to stay at home. And I would go out and say, well, yeah, but better than going out, it's better for me to go to the library. Well, yeah, but it's better for me to go out home rather than going to the library. Well, yeah, but it's better for me than going out, man. you know. So suppose that uh, we could be money pumped. Uh, they say, okay, what outcome do you prefer? Outcome A or outcome B? Oh, I prefer outcome B. Okay, if you pay me uh, one franc, you get outcome B. Done. You pay me one franc. Okay, wouldn't you prefer outcome C? Oh, yeah, I would. Would you pay me one franc? Yeah, I would. Okay. C. Hey, you're C. But C, A is better. Would you pay me a franc for it? Yeah, I would. So we would be money pumped. Right? This seems to be rational. So, uh, the intuition that betterness needs to be transitive can be stronger than any particular intuition we, will, we may have. So even if we have the strong intuition that uh, curing the, the, the headache is less important than uh, curing, uh, that saving the, the life of this person, if accepting this means rejecting transitivity, I'm sorry, but we can't accept that. Whatever moral view, no matter how awkward it may seem, no matter how monstrous it may seem, rejecting transitive seems to be just crazy. So, well, uh, that's basically it. Oh, uh, what the hell? Well, uh, whatever. Uh, that was the end of it. Fortunately, for you, maybe for me too, but not to the same extent. Hell, what's going on here? Well, whatever. Doesn't really matter. So, uh, thanks a lot for listening. Uh, I hope it was not that boring after all. And if you have any questions or any objections, uh, I would love to hear them. <laughs>